So, we've been talking over the past couple of weeks about businesses that find themselves in a buyer's market. So, just to repeat again, a buyer's market, there is more supply than there is demand. So, the buyers... Uh, can pick and choose who their supplier should be. And this is typified by very low prices. Um, there's lots of opportunities for buyers, lots of choice for buyers. Um, typically, there's very high levels of competition. Um, prices and margins are not precisely what they could be because there is so much competition and sometimes extreme competition. Contrast that with the seller's market, where the reverse is true. There are now more, um, more demand than there are vendors to satisfy that demand. So, um, we have buyers who are clamoring for products and uh, uh, seeking out sellers and in some cases begging for them to sell to them. It's a nice position for sellers to be to, into. And the extreme of that is where you have something that is A, totally unique, and B, highly desirable. And you then can pick and choose who you sell to. So if you're selling um, uh, a very upmarket um, sports car, uh, you know, a Ferrari, a McLaren, or, or whatever, uh, you can almost pick and choose your buyers because you can only get Ferraris from a very small number of people. And, um, and the buyer has very little power in that equation. Nice position to be. Complete reverse of that situation is where you have thousands or hundreds of sellers selling essentially the same product. And scrabbling for business and there's not as much business around so you know a typical example of that really bottom of the the buyer's market would be the people who live by submitting tenders and uh, that might be for for instance for construction projects and uh, so if you're a new small builder and uh, you have no track record, you could be submitting a lot of tenders before you are successful in making, uh, in signing a contract. I spoke recently to a person in that situation where they had submitted over a hundred tenders and they hadn't yet made the shortlist, let alone got a contract. So, um, you know, that's a tough business to be in. You're right at the bottom end of the buyer's market. Uh, similar things happen with online vendors and face-to-face and -face vendors of um, some types of cosmetics and uh, household products like soaps. And um, you, you see it among the, the hawkers and vendors where you will find uh, along some roads there are Ten stalls in a row, all selling oranges and all cutting each other's throat. So that's the bottom end of the buyer's market where there is far too much supply, not enough demand, and people scrabble for a living. Now I want to focus in this particular edition of this discussion on the rock bottom of the buyer's market. What happens if you find that you are down there? you're one of those 10 hawkers and everybody along the line is selling the same thing as you're selling. It probably started because you started selling oranges and people loved your oranges, so they bought a lot of cars, stopped and they bought a lot of your oranges. And then your neighbors who were selling, uh, I don't know, souvenirs or blankets or something like that, saw your success and thought, well, why shouldn't I sell oranges as well? So they went off and bought a whole lot of oranges and then they went into competition with you and they cut their prices down below yours and then a third person comes along and, and eventually nobody's making any money at all out of this. 
But it doesn't only happen with very low-level businesses like street talkers. It might be happening uh, quite high up the tree. So we get businesses which where there's enormous competition. Let's take an example of um, um, cell phone companies uh, marketing cell phone contracts or cell phones and, and um, pay-as-you-go offerings. There's every shopping center has at least one. Some of them have two or three. And um, they are all in competition with each other. The prices are all roughly the same. Now, you know, how do you survive in that? You, you have to give away a lot of advice, a lot of free advice, uh, because people come to you and say, how do I do this on my phone? And, you know, you can't very well turn them away or you can't say there'll be a charge of a thousand rand for that because they just won't ever come back to your shop again. And in many of these cases, they make their money by uh, simply selling all the accessories. You might find the same thing with filling stations. In some areas, there's filling stations all over the place. Um, there might be three or four, or even more in walking distance. And there's only so much traffic in that area. So the filling stations also have to supplement their income and you'll see that they will all have a car wash and a, and a, a shop, a 24-hour shop and uh, possibly some other services associated with that in order to increase their sales and therefore increase their profitability or make profit out of it. So it doesn't have to be the bottom end. It can be some quite high, some very expensive businesses. We consider something like a fast food franchise. We've got, um, uh, in many shopping centers, we have uh, uh, one or two pizza places. We have uh, um, a burger place at least, and maybe two of them. And they are competing against... Uh, some of the big retailers, food outlets, who also sell fast foods in some respect, and and they they find themselves in a very competitive market, especially if they're up against one of the very big players who spend a large amount of money on advertising and promotion and have a big following. So people just naturally gravitate to them. And you can see this. If you go around uh, to the various shopping centers, shopping malls, um, you'll see that there's a, a very popular pizza brand that's usually very, very busy. But there might also be um, and a popular burger brand that's very, very busy. Um, but there might also be a, a Chinese takeaway or a... a an Indian food takeaway or, or curry takeaway. There might be a uh, health food takeaway. Um, and all of these are in competition for that very scarce brand uh, that people are spending on instant meals. And some of those franchises are horrendously expensive. You have to pay very large amounts of money and then you're paying quite high rentals to be in a big shopping mall, and you have high costs. And if you are in a competitive situation, it's tough to make money out of many of these, which is why we often see uh, failures among some of the, the fast food places, sadly. So across the board, it can be the biggest or it can be the smallest, how do you, once you are down in that ultra-competitive mode where there's literally people next door to you selling the same or an alternate product that is in competition with you, perhaps at a different price or perhaps with a massively enhanced advertising and promotion budget, how do you compete? How do you find your 
your way to make profit out of all of that. It's a very difficult situation. And you you may well simply just get your head down and say, I'm going to do the best that I can. And many, many businesses do that and they survive and they make some money and they continue doing that for a, for a very long time, sometimes for a lifetime. And I think we can all think of examples of that happening. But you're probably not going to get rich that way. You're probably not going to be wildly successful in that. The objective is to take you from that rock bottom, highly competitive place into an area where you have a captive buyer's market who look to buy only from you. How do you do that? Not an easy, um, easy question, not easy answers around here. How do you get out of that bottom end of the market? Well, I think the, the first two solutions is recognizing what you, where you are and took, taking a long, hard look at your business and saying, am I competitive with the rest of the market? And if you're in retail space, that's easy. You can look around and count the number of customers going into each retail outfit. And that will tell you whether you're competitive or not. If you're in um, a hawker's stall, you can see how many, other, how many people are stopping at other hawker's stalls. But if you're not in a retail environment, if you're in a more uh, industrial or commercial environment, if you're a contracting company, uh, if you're a service provider, like a tax consultant or an accountant or a financial services broker, how do you see that you are comp that you are at the bottom end of the market? You have to do your research. And I'm afraid one of the things that entrepreneurs are not very well known for is taking a step back and being thinking strategically and saying, where exactly are we in the marketplace right now? Not hard to determine. The figures are, generally speaking, fairly easily accessible. All of your competitors are going to be on the internet. You could, um, all of them are going to be in social media and platforms like LinkedIn. You can do a lot of research and say, who are my competitors? And how well are they doing? You can check them out. You can see how, how big they are by comparison to you. Uh, you can uh, probably, in some instances, you can actually get their sales if they're in the sort of market where that information is published. So first step is to recognize it, and that may well require a lot of research, a lot of fact-digging, and you may need to get some expert advice on how to go about fact checking. And then the second step in getting out of that hole is, is an old rule that says, if you find yourself in a hole, first stop digging. <laughs> Don't make the hole deeper. That's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> And surprisingly enough, um, it has a very real application because too many people along the line, when they find themselves not making money because they're in a, a very competitive market and there aren't, uh, you know, there, there aren't enough buyers for all the sellers to, to satisfy, they simply do the same thing harder. So they're working now 12, 14, 16 hours a day, exhausted, unable to see the wood for the trees because they're just trying to do the same old, same old things faster. And that really is just digging the hole deeper. And, uh, you know, finally that hole is either going to collapse in on you or become a grave. It's, it's not a good way to, to proceed. So take stock of yourself. Do the research and then say, what are we doing that will get us out of here? And what are we doing that same old, same old, that'll just keep us here and draw the differentiation between the two? 
because that is crucial now. It is horrifying to say, I've got to stop doing things that have sustained my business for perhaps 20 years. It is absolutely horrifying to do that and very, very difficult to do. You can imagine an entrepreneur who's been successful where the business has been driving forward for many years and now market conditions have changed. The product is not as desirable. There may be alternates in the market and all of that kind of thing. And some of the old ways are not as effective as they were before. They were very effective some time ago, and now they're losing their effect because something has changed. We only have to look at the hotel industry and how it has been terribly threatened by the B&Bs to see that. Now, if you're a hotelier and you've got Airbnb taking all of your potential customers all of your potential residents, and you simply say, well, we will just be better. We will have cleaner rooms and uh, uh, faster room service. It's unlikely that you will succeed because that's what would have worked when your competition was all hotels. It's not going to work against the Airbnb. You've got to look at what is driving people towards those Airbnb. You know, there could be multiple reasons. It might be price. It might be the fact that you can access them very easily on the, on the internet and uh, get ratings and comments about every one of them very, very easily, just as a standard procedure. And you may not be offering that service. And so, the amount of privacy that I think the homes on Airbnb give as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, you've got a hotel, you've all, or you, you're always under scrutiny when you go in or, or out. They probably have security cameras in parts of the hotel. Um, mm. you, you don't have as much privacy as you would have in an Airbnb. And it might also just be a lot more friendly. Park your car, uh, you know, in a, uh, under a carport uh, next to your room versus parking in a basement, then catching a lift to the lobby, then catching another lift to the, the 15th floor mm. and reversing it every time you want to go out. So there may be convenience options, there may be price options, there may be something. If you're a hotelier and you simply say, we're going to do the old ways faster, then you're just digging that hole deeper for yourself. So you have to say, how can we compete? What have we got that the Airbnb hasn't got? Well, maybe you've got a 24-hour room service. Um, perhaps you've got uh, security personnel. Perhaps you've got all sorts of things. You've got a liquor license. Um, you might have all sorts of things, and those are the things you should actually be stretching and showing your hotel as an alternate to an Airbnb. But don't do just the, the old, same old, same old, same old, because that is going to just dig you far deeper into that hole. Now, we've only talked about hoteliers in that, but the same is true of many other instances where they simply hunker down and do whatever they did before. If we take uh, car sales or, um, uh, let's say, car hire businesses, and they're very, very big businesses, and then suddenly their casual car hire is attacked by the ride-hailing services like uh, Uber and uh, Taxify and all the others, and their short-term rentals fall like a stone. Now, you could keep saying we have the cleanest cars and we have the most available options and we have uh, wonderful insurances and, uh, um, you know, you can have um, no, mileage, uh, no limit on mileage and you can do all the things that used to sell higher cars. But you're not competing with the ride-hailing service because the ride-hailing, the person taking the ride-hailing service just wants to get to A to B. He doesn't care what features 
or on the car or what its fuel consumption is or what its exhaust emissions are or anything else. He just wants to get from A to B and pay a, pay a price for that and do it conveniently from his or her cell phone at the airport. Now, if you're trying to compete as a car hire business against that, you've got a tough, tough road to hoe. You're going to have to find ways of changing. And, of course, what's happened with the car hire companies is, to a large degree, they've uh, switched their, their thrust from short-term hire to longer-term rentals, where they rent out to companies over an extended period of time which is for them still a very profitable business. But that means that they are now impacting on the car sales businesses. Because instead of buying vehicles, you just rent cars from one of the car companies for an extended period of time. And if you don't like the car or if it uh, gives you problems, you give it back to them and they give you another one. And that then affects the workshops. <laughs> and so it goes on. Um, it's a complex world we live in right now. And if you're not on top of what's happening among your competitors, you could be doing the, the bad thing of just digging yourself a little deeper into the hole every time. So, you know, assuming we can recognize where we are, that we're in a hole, that we are facing uh, a high competitive position with not enough buyers to satisfy all of the products on offer to satisfy all of the vendors then how do we move from there into what is obviously the highly desirable position to go straight from the bottom to the top and end up with buyers clamoring to buy our services and there have been some very, very creative solutions that have done just that. The, the, one, of the, one of the loveliest ones uh, that I saw a little while ago and, and, uh, and in fact enjoyed was uh, in one of the primary tourist areas of the country. There are thousands of hotels, lodges and B&Bs. How do you stand out from all of those guys? How do you make yourself different? Well, these people came up with a novel idea, which was to establish a B and B in the middle of a rose farm. So <laughs> you go into your B and B, and you are surrounded by this incredible perfume and this incredible beauty of roses growing everywhere in profusion, and you know there are rose petals everywhere in the in the room, and there's huge bunches of roses and, and fresh herbs and everything. And what a lovely place it was to overnight in uh, on a business trip. Um, and I would go back there tomorrow morning just because it is so different. But the next time I tried to book there, they said, no, nah, sorry, we're kind of booked up for the next month or so. And I wasn't surprised because they were just so different to everything else. So they'd taken what is a very crowded market down the bottom, B&Bs, and they'd made it into something so unique that no one could compete unless you happen to own another rose farm. Clever, huh? Nice thinking. Um, and it's that kind of thinking that you need to apply to uh, ensure that you have the way to get out of your dilemma. So you first recognize your dilemma, you analyze your competitors, you realize what you're doing that's keeping you down, and then you start thinking, how can I make myself either unique, as in that situation, or alternatively, is how do I define a tiny little niche of the market, which to them, I am superior. So you can do it two ways. You can do it on the product side or server side, or you can do it on the market side. And once again, there are many, many examples of how companies have done that, where they have said they will specialize only in a certain area. I know we talked a little while ago about an IT service provider that would only sell to you if you fall, fell into a certain 
number of connected users and they wouldn't sell to you any other any other way so they defined their niche and said we will chase away customers who aren't in our target market and our target market is very narrow and we, we've had many examples of people doing just that there have been construction companies that say we only do refurbishments of um, industrial kitchens that's what we do for a living and we are specialists in doing just that and then whenever you know because the word gets around the whenever someone needs the industrial kitchen refurbished guess who they're going to go to that's just a for instance i don't know if there's a company that does that but if there isn't here's a nice business opportunity for you i know there are companies that have made their niche they ordinary uh, fitters of kitchen equipment and they've made their niche by specializing in supplying the fittings for certain types of fast food franchises there's another company that i do know of that has specialized in making their ordinary metal working company and what they did was to specialize in making feeding equipment for industrially farmed uh, chicken and pigs and other birds and animals like that. And that's all that they do. And they're highly specialized in that and they understand exactly that market. And it's not very difficult for them to make money. There are businesses that succeed by only making highly specialized car windscreens. Car windscreens for exotic or classic cars or buses or certain types of uh, trucks or whatever. So there are a number of examples of people who have a generic process like shaping and bending metal and welding metal together and turn those businesses into really unique where they are one of the very, very few suppliers that can supply in that market. Then guess what happens? You've defined it from the market side and you supplying the product the market wants and the market has to come to you because you're one of the only in that marketplace. So a couple of ideas there. I think what we're going to do next week is to explore the other end of the market and say, how do you get there and how do you stay there? So um, thank you to everyone who's been listening and thank you to the people who will pick up the podcast later. This uh, series is podcast. We'll be putting it out on all the social media. And um, we hope that you found some ideas in this where you could drive your businesses further forward and make lots of money. Because that's what we're interested in you doing. Have a great weekend.